everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Zags A Push. Today we are going to be targeting the populist movement of the latter part of the 19th century. So this is video two in period six. So we're really looking at the 1880s into the turn of the century. Let's begin. We're coming at you live. Well, not live, but you get it from the underground garage. Okay. Prior to the Civil War, the nation experienced a social, political, and economic democratization. We've talked about this many times. The Second Great Awakening fueled a social and religious revival for people to gain control of one's spiritual life. Politically, the age of Jackson, although this notion was not created but fostered by him, saw an increase in voter turnout due to universal white male suffrage. Moreover, Jackson prided himself as the, as the advocate for the common man. Economically, we saw the market revolution. Excuse me, we saw local markets, this Jeffersonian ideal of the yeoman farmer, morph into regional markets due to the canal boom. So we're seeing a transition in our economic markets. We're going from very localized to a regional market, Long Island oysters and buffalo. The Civil War would mark a lull in the growth of the notion of democratization in all categories. Post-Civil War America would once again see a reboot of the market revolution with the captains of industry and the reliance on the railroads taking form. Furthermore, the American identity was taking shape and the vision of America revolved around white Anglican and Protestant ideology. Those who didn't fit the political and social mold of the vision could use and were at times forced to move west, as our safety valve, as Frederick Jackson Turner would uh, comment on. Throughout our discussions on the west, we spoke about those groups who did not fit into the vision social, socially or politically. Today, we are going to target a group who did fit the mold socially and politically, but their economic concerns would eventually lead to a political movement that would once again see political, social, and economic democratization on the forefront of their party planks. We introduced the populist, or as it once was known, the People's Party. So before we get into this, what we need to do is kind of do an inventory, a status check of America in the 1880s. Farming becomes mechanized, okay? Your reapers, your threshers are, are then combined into a new mechanized um, piece of farm equipment called the combine. Um, there was also a large gap in, in, in inequalities in, in the social classes. The rich got richer, such as the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the J.P. Morgans, etc., and the poor get poorer. You're also seeing an economic downturn in the 1890s. This would rival the Great Depression, if not be worse than the Great Depression in the 1920s. This could go down as one of the worst depressions in American history. As a result, we're going to see unemployment skyrocket, and this all is kind of um, spurred by the railroads themselves being oversaturated, okay? What we see is a lot of construction costs are, are, are happening. The, the railroad is being overextended. They're, they're building new railroads without the need for it. it. The bubble, the rail bubble, what we see bursts. Now, we're also going to see this impact the farmers. That's the group that we're targeting today. But what we're going to see is the farmers in the West, really the Great Plains region and the South for that matter. Um, we, we heard the Pete Seeger song. I'll drop the, the line in there the, um, in the description about the farmer's man and really what was plaguing the farmers during this time period and their main issues. We saw the over, like I said previously, we see the oversaturation of the rail industry. We see falling crop prices. So the falling crop prices, supply is exorbitant. There is a massive amount of crops, of wheat, of grain, whatever the case may be, and the prices are dwindling after the Civil War. This is going to couple that with the economic depression of the time period. So the farmers are going to really get hit hard. They basically spend their life in debt. They are borrowing money to buy this new mechanized equipment. They're buying money for seed, for fertilizer, for land, whatever the case may be. And then they're looking for that October, or excuse me, that fall really harvest to pay back those loans. So they feel that they're cursed, cursed, by two entities, the banks, because interest rates 
And it's, it's very hard to borrow money during this time period. Borrowing money is very, very expensive. And two, we're going to see the railroads. The railroads during this time period were in cahoots. They had with the with the state legislators with bribing and, and all kinds of uh, political corruption during the era that would really hurt to you know would would really hurt the farmers. But just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog too. <laughs> they, they were creating these astronomical pricings for for goods where it was at one part it was cheaper to send goods on a long distance than it was on a short distance so this was really really hurting the farmers um economically and what we're going to start to see is the farm the farmers are going to push back because their idea is that the rest of the country as a result of the economy now being nationalized because of the railroads and the subsistence farming is going by the wayside the farmers themselves are going to have to, a little pushback. And that's when we're going to start to see that this is going to lead to the Grange movement. And this Grange movement really resembles the Freemasons, um, those fraternal clubs of the time period, secret organizations of such. But it's going to be a social club, basically. And it's a social club for 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 farmers to come together with their families and, and be around like-minded people, like-minded people that are sharing the same hardships of the farming industry um this this grange movement will eventually connect with other movements around the country such as the um the farmers alliance that we're going to start to see in the south we're going to see you know the the era of jim crow is still going to be plaguing the south so um african americans are not going to be included in this but african american farmers are going to start their own groups um for for african american uh, in that industry that are obviously going through this same hardships, if not worse. We're also going to see, as a result of these movements of people coming together, we're going to see a rise on the East with the urban workers and the unionization, such as the Knights of Labor, are going to start to take form here with these like-minded people. Again, very similar, like-minded farmers are coming together and, and forming the Grange movement. Like-minded urban workers are coming together to form uh, different trade unions. Um, we see women coming together, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union is going to start off where we're going to see a lot of um, reform era ideology coming back again in the 1880s and 1890s with temperance or the prohibition, the work for the prohibition of alcohol, um, prison reform, hospital reform, and obviously the, uh, the voting reform as part of that notion of political democratization. So we see all of these groups are forming and eventually they're going to form an alliance and they're going to come together and in the end form their own political party, which is going to be a third party the populist party and the populist party is going to have this this new economic platform this this platform that is going to reject this notion of free market capitalism it's going to reject um the big corporations that are coming about most notably the rail corporations and the the technology like the phone and the telegraph corporations we see the startup of at&t the big company at&t that we still have today got its start in in 1885 um so what their biggest grievance is is that in their entire platform we're going to see um notions of democratization politically and economically and as a result they're all interlinked together because they all in in turn affect each other and the president during his time period grover cleveland is he's not going to he's he's part of the problem really in the 1890s uh 1880s 1890s with his presidency is because he's going to look to turn back on, on the getting the getting the nation out of this depression by um rejecting the coinage of silver all right. He wanted to stick onto the gold standard and he's going to veto and turn down um, and look to repeal any type of legislation that promotes the coinage of silver because he's feeling that inflation, which it would cause because then you're going to have more greenback money. So we're going to see that rejection of the free coinage of silver by people like Grover Cleveland. And this is going to really, really um the, the farmers are going to have a lot of animosity towards this and they're going to call for what they another part of their their 
biggest party plank is bimetallism. So they want the free coinage of silver and gold. So they want to bring together silver and gold so that then the federal government can issue more paper money. Um, I have right here, I don't know if you could see it, this is called a large note. This is from the 1890s. It is a dollar bill. We could see like the size of it is a, it's, they called it a large note. And you could see right here where it says silver certificate. So really in theory, you could bring this to a bank during the time period and get its worth of silver. So this is called the black eagle, as you could see from the dark uh, inked eagle. And then this is the reverse on it. So this is pretty cool. Um, part of my currency collection. That's what happens when you're as cool as me. But um, one of the major items here is this bimetallism. It's going to cause inflation. Absolutely going to cause inflation. You're going to see um, you're going to see inflation on the rise as a result of this. Or if this actually went through the way that the populace wanted to go through, you would have seen a massive amount of inflation. Um, but they were okay with that. They were okay with that because they needed the cash to start paying back their debts. Other parts of their, their political party planks were the graduated income tax, um, where if, if you made more money, then you paid the government more money in taxes. The direct election of senators. This is really a political democratization. During this time period, we see that the legislators, the state legislators um, appointed, and they voted on themselves who the federal senators would be. And now this populist party plank is looking to give the people more power, give the people of the region more power, give the people of the state more power. Uh, because again, they feel that, especially the farmers, the farmers in Kansas, the farmers in Nebraska, the, those Midwestern Plains regional farmers feel that the Washington insiders, the Eastern establishment is not advocating for them. Where have we heard that before? That fear um, of, of this populist motive. Like, and, and populism is where the, 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 the common people, okay, where the common people feel that they don't have a voice in government or, uh, that, or that the government itself is not looking out for their needs. This is the same thing that we see similar to Andrew Jackson. And it's grown over time, the, the notion of the farmer. What does it mean to be a farmer? Dating back to Jefferson. Jefferson, on one hand, was looking at this ideology, this vision of America, the yeoman farmer. That would be the cradle of democracy. Equality, well, Jefferson has his own ideas on equality, and it's hypocritical at times as, as a, a man of his time period. He was definitely um, part of the aristocracy of the, of, the, um, of the time period. Jackson, on the other hand, takes that ideology of, of, of the farmer and, and bring it now being an advocate for the common man. Um, he wants to be, he, he's going to be the champion of the common man with his war hero and, and really, you know, connecting with that ideology. Now with the populist movement, you're bringing it to a much more larger scale on this national level now that we're seeing in this nationalized economy and, and these farmers, this Grange movement that got some legislation passed in their own individual states in the Midwest are now pushing for this national movement to happen and they're going to want to align themselves. So they're calling for direct election of senators. They support the eight-hour workday. They support trade unions. Um, they're looking for political uh, corruption to end. They're looking to, to, to reform um, government with the recall referendum and initiatives that we're starting to see. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to appeal to many groups. They don't want to be just a regional third party. They want to be a nationalized third party and they want to um, bring the urban workers into it. They want to bring the Southern farmers into it. They're even showing racial solidarity with African-Americans. 
Now, of course, the Southern farmers are going to dismiss that because they can't get over the fact of the white supremacy, the solid Democratic South during the time period of, of Jim Crow. But we're going to see that that's going to be the problem. Like the, the puzzle pieces are there, but cultural differences aren't going to really be able to bring all these groups together because um, a lot of immigrant groups in the East that are that are the, the urban workers, uh, Catholics as well, they're not sharing that same social vision that a Midwestern farmer is sharing, whether it's spiritually, morally, whatever the case may be. They're, 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 they're too far um, separated from that. So that's really what's not going to um, make this a more nationalized movement in that sense. But it does get national recognition, especially when their presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, who was known for these these great speeches, and we see his speech, his most notable speech is the Cross of Gold speech that he gives at the Democratic National Convention during the election of 1896. Press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And I'm sorry, I got to say this, but William Jennings Bryan, he's the Buffalo Bills of the presidential campaign trail of the latter part of the, the last decade of the 19th century and into the first decade of the 20th century. The guy just can't get a win, okay? He, he can't get a win. He loses to McKinley um, during this election in 1896. We know what happens to McKinley. He's assassinated and bring on, that's right, we're bringing on eventually in the next coming weeks. My man, Teddy. All right, so bring on Teddy after McKinley. So what we're seeing here is that William Jennings Bryan is, a, is, is this populist orator that he gives that cross of gold speech with, with basically saying that you're going to crucify us on this, on this cross of gold and basically saying that the, the, the wealthy, the, the Rockefellers of the time period are, are forcing this gold standard and it's really, really, really hurting the average farmer, the common man, he's really, truly an advocate. He's from Nebraska. Um, but what we're going to see is McKinley is not, he is on the populist party ticket, but he's also absorbed into the Democratic Party. So the populist party, as a result of their own success, actually fizzles out by the latter part of the 19th century due to the fact that the Democrats pick up William Jennings Bryan. They, uh, um, People during the Democratic National Convention are lifting William Jennings Bryan up like he just, you know, like he just won the Super Bowl as he's leaving um, the convention hall during this time period. I believe it was in Chicago. And the populist party may have died out, but their legacy is going to continue. The direct election of senators, the, um, the graduated income tax, this is all going to take form during the progressive era of the early 20th century. So while they do have, while they die out, so to speak, their, their ideology does not die out. Um, you know, they're calling for this regulation of, of big business and, and a check on big business. Remember, the government was behind the eight ball, so to speak, as technology was moving forward. So they couldn't create legislation. They couldn't even debate regulation like this is this is uncharted waters for them um this nationalized economy and and these new corporations that are popping up whether it's a standard oil corporation or at&t or the the rail corporation like we talked about in the last video with movement to the west the these these corporations um are unregulated during this time period because nobody knows how to regulate it. So when the government goes to regulate it, who are they going to ask? They're going to ask the rail companies, hey, how do we regulate you? Well, that's also going to you know, be an issue. So the populist party does not die. Their, their ideology is expressed well into the 20th century, and we do get constitutional amendments about this. Uh, we do get constitutional amendments that reflect the ideology of the populace, the People's Party, the era of the common man, this reform era reboot, if you will. This is Zags A Push. We're coming back at you. Our next video of period, our next video of period six will be the Gilded Age. Strive for the five from the underground garage. I'm out.